we are moving on to our next talk for care coordination for medically complex children. We have here Leslie Elder. Um, she has worked with mostly medical patients, uh, specifically pulmonary patients who are trach vent dependent for the last 30 plus years. She facilitates discharge home um, for those patients and has worked on several projects over the years to improve home safety, uh, uh, specifically the trach safe program if you've taken those classes. Um, so please welcome Leslie. So yes, very happy today. And there's so many topics within this talk that we could actually have a whole conference on all by themselves. So I'll be able to uh, give you highlights and overviews of some pretty deep topics, uh, but we'll, we'll get as much coverage as we can. So object objectives for today, so we're going to define children that are medically complex um, as a subset of children overall. And then what does care coordination look like uh, for the child and the family? Because it's, it's really preparing both for discharge and for a success outpatient. And then what does the discharge process look like on some, at, a, at a high level? Because this is a, that's a pretty deep topic right there, but we'll give it to you um, in the bullet points that make the most sense. Um, and then parent education process. Uh, how we integrate them back into the community on the first discharge, uh, the next discharges, and, um, and as an outpatient. And then how do we keep them home and safe? How do we try to prevent readmission to the hospital? So let's talk about some definitions of children with medical complexity or CMC. So some definite, you know, there's lots of definitions out there. I pulled these out because I thought that they really sort of spoke to it uh, succinctly and directly. So uh, from the references listed below. So bullet points here, chronic conditions affecting multiple organ systems, some medical fragility, and the usual healthcare system does not not necessarily set up to meet their very unique needs, and they are high resource utilizer. Uh, AAP, I pulled this out as a quote, is children who have medical or behavioral conditions that impact two or more body systems, have high utilization rates and needs for healthcare services with technological assistance or dependence, which is a lot of the groups that I work on, um, as I am with saying, uh, trach and vent dependence is something that I've been working on for many years. And so, you know, would become across centers children with medical complexity. I had to go on and describe a little bit about, more about this group. They experience, these children and the families too, uh, considerable life limitations related to the illness, a really high need for healthcare services and intensive supports, medically fragile, 25% um, of all hospital days for children, a higher cost of care, which is not a surprise. It's one third of all pediatric healthcare costs uh, listed by the uh, resource below. And then the only Medicaid, talking specifically, they're only 6% of the Medicaid population, but those 6% takes 40% of the cost, which is a huge share of the, of the pot of money to take care of these kids. And then really no, no, uh, not uh, surprising that there's a high rate of hospital readmission, um, typically for acute illnesses. Um, as you know, the viral season, certainly what we're seeing this time of year is when we see a lot of these uh, medically complex kids come back into the hospital, but also other care needs like surgery or other medical needs. So as we talked really, it's a subset of all children. So if we have all children here in this square, children with special health care needs, and then within that, children of medical complexity, so, you know, all children speak for itself, children with special health care needs. There's lots of different examples. You know, maybe that's a child who um, has NG feeds, you know, um, it might be for a simpler problem like, um, you know, dysphagia. You, you could say maybe that's just a child with special health care needs versus a child with medical uh, complexity. Again, two or more systems, fragile. Uh, risk of hospitalization, all of those things would sort of make the difference um, to get you into that category instead. So complex care coordination needs. So it's, it's the first discharge, it's the next discharges, and then once home, how do we take care of these kids? And to, things to consider are the sites of care. So we have home, which has its own unique challenges, and then how do we reintegrate these kids into school? 
and how do we take care of them in the hospital and get them back home? Then there's lots of considerations for caregiving. Is this child going to be able to go to daycare, you know, just based on needs? And then should they go to daycare? We have many of our uh, you know, population in pulmonary who are maybe 25, 26 weekers. Their lung disease is bad enough that going to uh, daycare in itself, even if they're accepted, would put them at risk of getting a viral illness. Um, same with uh, maybe older, um, you know, 30, 32-week uh, preemies who maybe are on oxygen at night. Again, a real risk for them at daycare, and, and daycares may or may not take them. Um, then we have the caregivers at home that we have to think about and getting them prepared. And then home nursing, uh, which is fraught with difficulty right now because there's such a shortage. And we have so many children in the hospital who can't go home because there's not enough home nursing. And there really truly could be a whole conference just about the caregiving aspect here. It's a pretty deep topic. Uh, we also have to set up therapies. Uh, so birth to three, so that's also early early intervention, same thing. It's in the whole state of Washington that each county has its own birth to three center, which is home-based therapies. Different in the hospital uh, where we kind of do therapies for kids. These are therapies that are done at home, but really by the caregivers. So the birth to three comes to the home, writes up a therapy plan, hands it to the caregivers and says, here, do this, you know, twice a day, three times a day. So really the therapies fall to the families um, to get done. If you're over three, it goes to the school districts. And if uh, there's also the option of private therapy, if you have commercial insurance, you can choose that option. Uh, lots of supplies um, that come with this group of children, complex regimen of, of medications, a, a lot of burden when it comes to refills, prior us, you know, at the clinic level, that parents having to work through denials and prior us and waiting for medicines and calling and refills in time. So, again, medications is, can be can get pretty deep and and um, really be something that parents have to keep track of and always aware of refills so they have enough time to go through all of the complexity of getting filled. A lot of equipment, uh, even mobility, so the kids that need wheelchairs and standards and walkers, all things we have to think about. And then there's always insurance. Uh, insurance, uh, Medicaid is actually a pretty good actor when it comes to paying for home nursing. It's the commercial plans that give us the most of denial and appeals. Um, many plans have a carve-out for or an exclusion for home nursing, which we go through a lot of appeals uh, to reverse that. People lose the insurance and what are we going to do? Or they change insurances. So usually at the first of the year there might be a different insurance and then we kind of got to rework um, those changes. We have to think about growth and development, uh, making them, helping them have their best light. How are, is everyone coping in the family, not just the child? What are the challenges? How is this child interacting with peers uh, or even parents, how are they interacting with their peers and trying to have an adult life outside of, of taking care of this child? Uh, and then case management, which I, is a I, think, I think a really important component of helping these kids and families do the best at home. And then you'll see this, is the plan safe really throughout my presentation? Because I really want that always to be a big consideration of anything that we do to take care of these kids. Is, is this a safe plan? So the first discharges uh, for the family, parents, guardians, and siblings, you know, we have to really work hard to meet their basic needs, but some of that we get on to these other things. If we don't have their basic needs met, such as housing, food, utilities, transportation, it's really a hard to attend to the needs of these kids unless we've really helped them meet their basic needs. So we, we really pay a good attention here. Um, Limited resources for all of these things, as all of us know, but we try to connect people with the best things that we know of to help them. And then there's the baby things, so cribs, strollers, diapers, car seats, uh, those things are specific to the child. Sometimes it's a special car seat, and sometimes it's just a regular car seat, uh, such as a giant in Salicyl, right, does not go in a regular car seat, so we have to get a special car seat, or spinal conditions maybe require a special car seat. 
And then really as far as education, this is really what I fall on for many of the getting our, um, taking care of our kids. There should be no surprises. We should be anticipating things ahead of time, not necessarily telling the families because I think we have to parcel it out so they don't get overwhelmed, but anticipating what may, might be a surprise to them and saying all the things that we can at the right time when they're ready so that there are no surprises over time. Uh, if there's no surprises with me when I um, feel like that they understood everything kind of came their way, then that for me helps me feel like I've done a good job that they weren't surprised. Uh, and it has to be repetitive. Um, I, I pontificate to my colleagues that it takes about three times sometimes to say something before it sticks especially in a hospital situation when so much information is coming at you, we can't go off of this assumption that one and done is enough. We have to be repetitive. We need return demonstrations from them. They need to practice uh, the care. It's a, you know, it's for trait vent dependence, well, actually anything. It's learn and practice, learn and practice over and over until it feels sort of like normalized that this is something you can do. It doesn't take a lot of thought. And then education should be standardized so that everybody that needs a certain level of education, a certain type of education, no matter who they are, gets standard education and there's not differences. We certainly tailor to language, literacy, um, culture, best that we can uh, when it's indicated, but the, with the overarching goal of being standardized as it applies. And then please realize that these parents are juggling roles uh, within the hour sometimes. And I, you know, I've got this spinning plates down here. So there's, there's sometimes there are parents, and some parents would tell you that feels like a luxury when you can just be a parent because you're going into roles such as the chief nurse, the organizer, the pharmacist, the OTPT, the mom and the dad, which means to the siblings, the other siblings if they exist, the partner, so the relationships that they're in as adults uh, and their friends, actually, they may be an employee, so that's what they're juggling with. And then how do they even do self-care? How do they find even the 10 minutes to walk around the block? And so these juggling of roles is something I hear about from parents actually quite often of how difficult it is to be bouncing around through all these different roles and not being able just to be the parent. Um, and spending way too much time, actually, out of all these roles of being the nurse. And then case management also for the family, so not just the child, but how can we meet basic needs? Where did, what do you need to know you didn't know? How can I help you cope with all of these challenges in your life? What can maybe we take away or reorganize? And sometimes it takes, the, you know, the PTSD, and I've had parents tell me this, I've, and you'll see this in the presentation, they had the dream of, of, you know, when they were having this child of what it would be like, and they've lost that dream. Um, and it's not just at the beginning. It kind of continues throughout the, the life of the child, of the dream of, you know, they're 16, uh, they would have been driving and they're not, or they're five years old and they're not going to kindergarten for some reason, or, you know, those or she would have been walking by now, but now she's not. So it's sort of a perpetual ongoing loss of a dream with the child. And then the first, this is like a big takeaway for me, uh, for you all, is to listen. Uh, so just, I've gotten calls sometimes where, you know, parents don't necessarily know, but I'm, I'm double tasking <laughs> by listening to them and maybe getting some other work done at the same time, uh, providing empathy, trying to plan with them, but really listen to what they have to say. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and sometimes it's not doing. Sometimes it's just listening. It's not coming up with something that's an action item, but just listening. And then I gave this that my, its own slide because this is, you know, at my core, never miss an opportunity to tell a caregiver that they're doing a great job. These families don't get that kind of, of reinforcement, that pat on the back, the encouragement of look what a good job you've done. Look at this three-year-old who's bright and shiny and happy running around the room, and that's you, Mom and Dad. You did a great job. So please don't miss an opportunity to tell these families that they've done a good job. You will see them glow, 
And it's one of the my nicest times when I uh, say, when I remember, and I try to remember often, is you've done a really good job. And I really want that to be one of your takeaways from today as well. So for the first discharge home, really, I call it, or if you organize yourself, you're going to organize the family and uh, so that we don't have any blunders, so we don't have any misses. And I just gave you a quick snapshot here. This is the first two pages of a five-page uh, list of things to do to get a trait vent child home. Not so much the content. This one happens to be organized in time. So before they come out of the ICU, first two weeks, two to four weeks, what would you think about? And so it, because when I have, and similar to what case managers would have, you're not just taking care of this one family. You have 10, 20, 30, 50, you know, whatever your caseload is. And uh, I have to keep myself straight, and so I don't miss anything. So I give the family the best of what I have to give. I follow a checklist for each patient. And then I also use it for a charting tool as well to make sure I'm capture, capturing all the work that we've done. So home nursing, again, this is really a big topic, but there is a, uh, not a surprise to anybody that there's a national shortage of nurses. There's a regional shortage. And how I describe it to parents is that, you know, if there's this many nurses, there's this many in pediatrics, and there's that many that want to do a pediatric treatments at home. And, um, you know, they're not the only kids who get nursing, but most of the kids get nursing who have that care. It's, the low, it's a lower paying nursing job. Uh, and so there's, and especially like if you live in, uh, if the child lives in Seattle, there's so many places for a nurse to work that, um, that pay more, that getting that subset of nurses is pretty difficult. We do our best. We refer to all the agencies that serve the area of the family. So we don't have favorites. We refer to everybody that serves there. Uh, and we do weekly calls to check on staffing. We give parent updates weekly. And we time anticipate, anticipatory guidance, which is what I tell parents. Um, I, again, don't want any surprises and let them know that we call weekly. We've checked again this week, mom or dad, and here's the story. And I'm just so sorry. We don't have anything to offer you. Um, and then anticipate kind of what their grief points will be around that and help them through that. And then good working relationships in the community are really important uh, to you. I, I found that very helpful in getting these kids home. Insurance. Um, no is not always a final answer. That's one of the takeaways I want you to have today is if the insurance says, says no, I say, okay, uh, what's the appeal process? And you deny, appeal, deny, appeal, deny, appeal until uh, it's exhausted and you have other options. Um, there's something called an alternate plan of care, which means instead of changing the policy for all of the kids on the policy, because that opens up them to a lot of expenditure risk, is just doing it just for that one child. And we've gotten good results from that. Also, there's something called a flexible <clears throat> excuse me, benefit option, which means if the insurance has that in their plan, and most do, they can substitute a benefit for um, something that's not covered if it's cheaper than hospitalization. You can get a lot of mileage out of that. Uh, single case agreements, we get higher reimbursement rates. So they might be contracted, but we'll get a higher reimbursement. Let's just say they contracted, the agency contracted with insurance for $50 an hour. Um, if they'll sometimes do a single case agreement, maybe up to 60 or $75 an hour or more. I've seen up to 80 uh, to try and get and uh, re attract and retain the nurses. I've seen that. Um, then how many hours are covered because you'll have to maybe negotiate that. And then Medicaid is always a pair of last resort. And what we find when many of these um, commercial plans is they try to slide this off to Medicaid. And by law, Medicaid is a pair of last resort. And this U.S. Title Court 42, I really want you to, to oops, take into that as well for today, that any insurer who's making payments, you can read all the middle, can't take into account that they have Medicaid when they want to make a benefit decision. I had to actually say this to an insurance on Wednesday who was making a benefit decision because the child had Medicaid, and I had to say that's illegal. 
you can't do that. Um, it, whether or not they have Medicaid is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the plan that you have, and then I go into alternate plan of care, flexible benefit option, and nicely, and, but nudge, I nudge them towards uh, not having no be the final answer. And so the first is charge gun again, parent education. So I'll, I'll give you just, again, this is a snapshot of the pages that RT uses to organize their training. So it's standard, it's formal, they take the family out of the room, go to a spot and do the training with their supplies, they have mannequins and they go through the education. And they're checked off by the RT um, discharge. We encourage them to practice in between because it's not just watching, it's repeating. And we have to now get special permission for other families, to, family members to attend because of the COVID restrictions, but we'll do that. And then grooming and prior to discharge, which really so much is not for us, it's for them. It's for families to double check what they think they know and practice. So it's a really important, parents sometimes feel nervous about they're gonna be judged or tested, and we try and prepare them again anticipatory wise um, that it's not to test, it's not for us, but it's for you. So equipment, DME and supplies, um, you know, what they're using in patient is going to be what, what we try to get outpatient. And uh, so that's, that's where you start. And we'll check the inpatient orders to develop the outpatient orders. And then something might not be, there's lots of hospital things that aren't available outpatient, such as a bear hugger, like it's, it's one of those machines that warm you up. Very lovely machine. I wish I had one for myself at home uh, to be warmer. Uh, it goes under the blankets on this mattress and warms up kids nicely. Lovely piece of machine. Um, you can't get it outpatient, so we have to come up with some other method when we can't use that machine at home. Where do they live? So that's actually one of the um, one of the first questions I ask when I am going to get a child out of the ICU is where they live. What's their name and where do they live? Because there's things that are gonna happen different in, in OMAC or Walla Walla than they are in Renton. Uh, and so we have to uh, tailor, sometimes that means getting pretty extreme. Uh, we had, I had a case in Montana, we had to send an RT uh, to Montana to educate the community on the care of this child. They lived at the end of a 10 mile long gravel driveway. And we really had, we educated the hospital, the air ambulance, the RTs, the equipment company uh, to get everyone mobilized because in Three Forks, Montana, um, there's not a lot going on with complex medically children. So thinking outside of the box, I'll jump to the bottom here. A lot of work is here, but I would say I'm out of the box working on hard stuff probably 25% of the time. Um, so, you know, it, you don't have to stay in the box. Again, don't take no as an answer. Find out what else you can do. Uh, think outside the box. Think, be creative. Talk to people and, and be novel. Don't always have to stay on the, on the usual road. What services provided by the DME companies? And is it 24-7? So not, uh, not all companies operate the same. Case in Alaska recently where they don't have an RT in the office or available 24-7, so we had to come up with some different plans. Now, what, what is their response time? So usually it's a two-hour response time uh, for DME companies that they don't take anybody outside of of two hours, but in Alaska, since there's lots of people that are complex that are rural, they actually use a lot of telemedicine and a lot of getting on FaceTime and et cetera, because it's just not realistic given the area that they live that they can be within a two hour response time. Some places in Alaska don't even have roads. Um, you can only get there on a snow machine or an airplane. Uh, again, what's covered by insurance, sometimes the quantities per month by the insurance isn't enough. Uh, we see that with suction catheters and we have to appeal that uh, to get them what they need. And then reminding some DMEs that private insurance will give you more than Medicaid. Sometimes the DME companies fall back to what Medicaid or Medicare gives and uh, we've got to remind them sometimes, no, they have 
a private insurance, they should be able to get more. So it's a good thing to check. I'll be repetitive here. No, it's not always a final answer, uh, especially it's not ever been done before. Those are trigger words for me like, oh, that's interesting. Let's see how we can rethink about this and think outside the box. So home nursing orders. So the, the orders that we generate at start really are generated from what's going on inpatient, and we sort of translate those into outpatient to really continue the same plan of care, which we send to the agencies. We can't send into the school unless we have a release of information, but if the child's going to go back to school, we will do that. And then there's sort of hard and soft orders, and some might argue, well, you don't need to say um, parents prefer bath in the evening. Is that an order? No. But it gets people off to a good start, a good foot forward. It's more informational. But as far as the way the paperwork goes from these agencies, they, they work off of written orders. So we provide that information to them to get everybody off uh, to a good start. You know, the first two, LASIS and SIMOAC, those are, you know, the first part of those, they're very much of usual ordering. Uh, and, and we build a lot of, of, uh, of latitude by having parents be able to direct some of this, which gives our parents really like and um, because then they can direct the care. We give parents copies of the orders, um, and we give input. We want input. We want to hear what they don't like. We want to incorporate the requests, and we fax them to the agencies. Uh, verify settings um, on the machine itself. So I have to tell you, when kids come to clinic, uh, funny enough, I would say about once every one and a half vent clinics, there's the wrong settings in the machine, and it happens all the time. It happens here when uh, sometimes RTs change the orders, uh, or I'm sorry, change the settings, uh, such as alarms, uh, so we don't get frequent alarms. And um, so we have to check the machines before they go home to make sure they're set as ordered. Some that's due with oxygen and oximeters as well. Uh, home versus delivery uh, at the hospital, again, that's not, we have to allow for inconsistencies because it's a big order. People forget things. We don't want to set up on the day of discharge, at least the day before, if not the week before, so we can correct any inconsistencies. And I kind of explain this to parents. If you get the if you think of it as you get what Costco has. So if you go to Costco, they have that piece, that um, houseware thing. You could, you can't ask for the other one because that's what they carry. And so we prepare the parents by thinking about it. it might be different at home than what the hospital uses. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we just have to adapt to that because you get what the DME company has. How many will insurance provide? There's some with like vent circuits. You can get one a week or if there's one a month and one a month is not, in, not enough. So that's where you have to work with them and insurance and get it to be different. Give them a small supply when they go home to try and bridge the gap and just make sure, you know, nothing uh, more than two or three days worth of a couple items. And then how do we get them home? Sometimes it's Medicaid transportation, which we're very thankful for. That helps us a lot. We do. So education, uh, parent room and prior to the first discharge, and really important to keep it equitable here, but then with a lens of equity, because of our, our unconscious bias um, or just outright bias that maybe, hopefully, people don't have but could have that we want to make sure that we're asking the people to room in consistently and equitably and we don't have any differences or any assumptions made um, about parents who come from different ethnicities, different locations, different levels of education, different language, that we don't make any assumptions. And we may ask them to room in again if they've had extensive care plan changes. We really try and room in towards the end. Sometimes things happen and we have to push it off. Um, but if there's been extensive changes, we'll ask them to room in. And then uh, formal education, again, on equipment, procedures, meds, and we ask them to return demonstration. Um, we do an EMS notification for our trick fan kids, but not for all kids. EMS doesn't have the bandwidth to hear about all of the kids going home on, say, oxygen or G-tube feeds or they have seizures. Um, you know, they'll probably take the information, but it can be overwhelming. And certainly within the medical one area, 
to hear about all of the medically complex children. Uh, we certain do, certainly do this for our trach vent population and have a really strong uh, relationship with Medic One for those. Uh, we contact the PCP. We send records that they need to. Uh, many people have access to my chart, which has been really helpful. We get appointments, therapies we've kind of talked about a little bit. Um, early intervention we've talked about. And then IEP planning for schools. I had an IEP meeting for a student uh, last week who's going to head back into the school system at some point. Those are really helpful to help the student and to help the school anticipate the needs. Certainly if the school has stairs, how often is the school nurse present? Uh, who would be doing med dispensing if it's, if it's necessary? What's the plan for home nursing? So. So the village that takes care of these kids so that it, instead of looking like this, like this jumbled up spaghetti, how do we make it look like this at home? Now, it's not going to be smooth sailing. There's going to be a few white gaps here. But how do we take this? How do we use our village, such as palliative care, hospice, case managers, which can be from several locations, insurance, that the doctor's office, nursing agencies have them, many clinics have them not just at Seattle Children's, but also, you know, Mary Bridge and Sacred Heart, and then just other clinics at large. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate here to have what we call TLC, which is Transitional Longitudinal Care. And it is for a set of complex medically children, nurses dedicated, I think there's four, maybe there's five nurses in TLC who are dedicated to helping these kids be and these families have this experience and not that experience. So removing any barriers, helping them problem solve, it's really a valuable, uh, valuable program. I wish we could make it bigger. <laughs> we need a lot more people um, to take care of it. I wish we could. And the village also includes the PCP, which we hope is the medical home. You know, truly, some of our medically complex patients uh, spend more time with the subspecialists here at the hospital than they do their PCP, uh, and so it's different for each child. Uh, but, you know, we still want the PCP to be the medical home uh, if, if, uh, if that makes sense for that child in particular. Counseling might be needed for the child, the parent, the sibling. Siblings I've seen over the years um, I've seen siblings get pretty sad uh, and feel a little bit pushed to the side sometimes um, because their sibling is just has just requires more help. We have to remember the siblings and how are we taking care of them. And we see a lot of families now that are on Facebook, a lot of Facebook groups, uh, social media. There's Parent Voices. Uh, the Ark of Washington is another support, informal support. You know, and they seem to rather organize themselves these days on Facebook. It's actually a pretty big forum for, for moms and dads to get together and talk about how hard this is or how or give advice or ask advice, ask a question. They network. They certainly network here in the hospital. So many friendships and um, sources of support for these parents uh, who meet in the hospital and then stay connected. And then the power of listening, and I have to remind myself of this myself to be always do better, that the biggest communication problem is we, is we do not listen to understand, but we listen to reply. And I know I have to work on this, not listening so I can figure out what I'm going to say to make you help you feel better, to resolve the issue, to think of a solution. Is instead of listening to understand, because there's lots of nonverbal communication as well. So I, I hope that's a takeaway for you today is to listen to understand instead of listening to reply, which I, I think is a sort of internal fight most of the time as we're, in, we're inclined to reply, especially as medical professionals to have a response or reply that's going to help them have a solution. And then what do you, what do parents want you to know? So I sent out, um, you know, a query to some of the parents I've been working with on projects. And these are their responses. And I, I wanted, and I pulled these out because these were, these were good ones that I thought had a lot of good message. So that, this one dad said, I'm pretty sure I have low level PTSD. A typical parent worries 
Typical, typical parent worries are escalated with fragile kids, such as sleep. A typical kid will wake you up or feel sick, where our kid can get a mucus plug that can suffocate them. Thankfully, we do have a lot of help. However, this results in exhaustion due to managing 24-hour care with constant juggling, negotiating, debating the needs of our child with doctors, nurses, nursing agencies, schools, paraeducators, bus drivers, med equipment managers, PTs, OTs, and three supply companies. So, uh, and that's why I like TLC, uh, the group that we have here, because they do a really good job helping families work through these, these challenges. Another mom, C is in no way typical. He loves to keep changing the rules. I've had years of practice following his cues and caring for him in the way that keeps him comfortable. He is more than a room number or a medical record number. He's my life. Let me care for him as much as I am able. It lessens your load. Let me do my job as his mother and keep him cared for like he's used to. The hospital is a scary place with many different sounds and smells, and I am his safe place. It's like being a constant alert at all times. Even when you have help and you get a break, you are still looking at your phone, anticipating anything you have to engage in the fight mode for whatever action is needed. Constant awe in what my son has endured and can continue to overcome despite his medical diagnoses. And then from a doctor. For many parents, their critically ill child in the hospital is not their only source of extreme worry. They may be on the verge of eviction, about to lose their income, maybe fighting a serious illness like cancer themselves. True story. They may be worried about their children in the hospital and even more worried about the child who's at home being cared for by relatives because that child with special needs or behavioral challenges is or not coping well with the separation. Worries about immigration, legal proceedings, family relationships, abuse, health, mental health, housing, insurance, on and on. They don't stop when your child is critically ill. The families we care for juggle so much and often face judgment from team members who wonder why they're not at the bedside more or why they are not coping better. And I wish we all had more perspective about this. So talking more about is the plan safe? And when I thought about this slide, it's like, well, what kind of a picture would represent that? <laughs> and sometimes the safety margin is this thin. But what can we do to balance the, the safety risks so that we make it the safest plan that we can? And I didn't have a word for this a couple of years ago, but I was explaining to someone how I went about doing what I do. And they said, oh, you have a preoccupation with failure. I thought, yep, that's what I do. And so using those words, it's, an, it's, an, uh, it's a daily mindset to have prioritized and identify anything that can go wrong, the risk, what, do I for, what did I forget? I don't want to forget anything, any oversights for all the care environments. How can it go wrong? And what can I do so that it doesn't go wrong and that we stay safe? And it's the short game versus the long game. So in the short game, I can get them out of the hospital, but the long game is keeping them out of the hospital. What will generate questions? Anticipating what will generate questions? What will generate confusion and phone calls? And is it doable? So when we have somebody, if a doctor says we want to send a child home on Q4 hour this and Q6 hour that, probably not feasible at home. It's a really hard thing to do for families to, to do the frequency. Every eight hours is more than enough. If you've ever taken antibiotics and you have to take them three times a day, knowing that, you know, that is hard for adults sometimes to do. And then uh, another doctor told me this, that if we kept everybody in the hospital that we worried about, nobody would go home. And because we do worry, and, and what, I think what we do, this preoccupation with failure or worry, so to speak, we do have to sort of, you know, have to take the leap when you think you've done everything you can to take care of them and give them the best that, that they can to have their best life. And you have to go home, and we can't keep them in the hospital because we're worried because that would be 
almost all of them for me. And then a deference to expertise. I take a drink, Kara. So regardless of position or education level, defer to the individual more familiar with the process and interventions to manage the care related to their specialty, but also in concert with the team. So if you see the difference. So the dietitian should have the should the people should be following the recommendations unless somebody else has a worry, like a preoccupation with failure, that Q12 or feeds at night is not doable, right? So it's the recommendation against what's the preoccupation with failure, how could it go wrong? And then building competency and reliability. So we do have a trick safe emergency airway diagram so we created several years ago that is sent to the EMS first responders so that they know the emergency airway plan. And that has something that has been really good, I think, good feedback from the community on how that helps safety. And we teach to it with parents as well so that they know what the emergency airway response plan is. Can they be bagged from above? Can they be intubated from above? Because not all can. Um, the who to call list, very important. So when you're inpatient, you, it's kind of like one stop shopping. You're on that team, the team kind of takes everything. When you're outpatient, the specialists back up to their level of specialty. So like otolaryngology owns the trach, neurology owns the seizures, pulmonary owns the lungs, GI, obviously the GI tract and feeding, right? Feeding's a little bit shared between services. So, but, and that's hard for families because they haven't had to do that inpatient. So figuring out who to call is big, is hard. It's really hard for these families. Who do I call for what? And it takes time when they first go home. But having a phone list of who to call is really helpful to families, something that I get a lot of good fe uh, feedback back from families that they like to have it. And then process improvement, which is one of the things I love, is never doing something because that's the way you've always done it. I'm not, I'm not cut from that cloth. And I would encourage everybody, um, I love process improvement. And if you have something, if you have a program that's not working, sometimes not working with insurance or a refill or DME, improve it. Um, and it's easy, maybe sometimes it's necessary at a time constraints to kind of cock your head and toss it away and say, I just don't have time. And I get that because I have to do that sometimes too. But process improvement initiatives need to be part of our fabric when taking care of these kids. So there's so much the state of Washington and the federal government can do better when it comes to kids with medical complexity. So the, the takeaways for today, um, I've touched on them. No surprises. Anticipate what they need to know. Give them guidance. Not all at one time because we'll put them on overload. So you have to parcel it and give it out to them when they're ready. You don't talk to them necessarily what five-year-olds are going to be like or 10-year-olds are going to be like with this problem when they're one. Now, maybe some parents want to know, and that's fine. Uh, but we don't want to overwhelm them. So when it seems like good timing to share information and they're ready, anticipate what's going to help them so there's no surprises. Return demonstrations on skills and knowledge, again, through whatever process, um, education process, they're all different, different places, but having them show you back what you just told them, have them tell you what they heard so that we know that it's, that it's stuck and have them practice. Standard education, I can't say I, you know, I am very um, bonded to lists to make sure I stop and think about each thing for each child so I don't forget. And when I'm taking care of 20 of them, my risk of forgetting is high. So organizing yourself means you organize the family. No is not the final answer. It's, a, it's another point of decision. Am I going to push on that? I'm going to try and make it different. I'm going to advocate or I'm not going to throw myself on that sword, we'll let that one go, we'll do this instead, and work outside of the box for uh, novel and, and but safe solutions uh, that haven't been done before. 
and maybe we hadn't ever gone to Montana to teach a whole community, but it got this child home. That was the first time. Recognize the trauma of our, of our uh, caregivers, our siblings, even our children, uh, the coping, and also, though, the joy, because it's not all bad at these houses. I don't mean to imply at all that it's just hard, hard, hard. These families have great love for these children and help them to live their best lives, and they get a lot of joy when these children are living their best life. Now, maybe it's not the usual sort of childhood existence, but they're still, they're very happy uh, with what they can help this child achieve. So recognize the joy also that they have in taking care of these kids and listen. Listen without trying to always come up with an answer. Uh, preoccupation with failure, a deference to expertise. And then finally, uh, one of my big takeaways, I hope, is never miss an opportunity to tell a parent or a caregiver that they're doing a great job. If you want to see somebody glow uh, from the inside out, just tell that to parents as you go because it's, it's upwards of 99% of parents. When I tell them that, you can just see this inner glow come out. And uh, I love seeing that. And they need to hear it uh, because life is hard. Uh, there's a lot of guilt, uh, fatigue, uh, relationship problems, money problems, the rest of it, things that plague them. But please remind uh, yourself to, to tell them that they're doing a good job. So that's what I have for you all today. Are there, the first one is, are there criteria to be met for a child to be assigned an insurance case manager with Medicaid? Yeah, so most of the uh, kids in Medicaid are assigned now to an MCO or managed care organization. Uh, and there's five of them. Uh, it's very uncommon now to be a child with Medicaid, what we call straight Medicaid, and go to an MCO, managed care organization. Within those MCOs, yes, there are case managers. Because there's five of them, everybody has different criteria as to who qualifies. I would say the, the vast majority of children with medical complexity would qualify for a case manager. Uh, there's inpatient case managers, there's outpatient case managers. I have found sometimes there's a bandwidth issue as far as, you know, they would like to take you and you would fit the model, but they're taxed with the number of kids. That's a barrier. Um, but yes, so the criteria are different across across uh, the MCOs, but you, uh, with the children's medical complexity, a pretty good shot uh, at getting them into case management. And, you know, the case managers here at Seattle Children's, we work a lot with uh, um, MCO case managers. And if anybody needs help as to who's the manager, first of all, they have a department. If you could find the phone number online, call their 1-800 number or whatever. Uh, but we can also uh, turn you on to their case managers we know. Thank you. And then this is a question re uh, from a nurse who have had to basically be the case manager in the community, and they're curious if um, if there is anybody at Children's to help families instead of having that um, burden on the school well, nurse who, and this person is in a rural area. Yeah, well, that's my, that, wouldn't that be lovely? And I would love to, I would love to run that company, actually, um, if we could have helping families uh, instead of the school nurse being the case manager. We do have TLC here, t Transitional Longitudinal Care, that um, they do a great job. It's just limited, and they have to stay limited. There's so much need for it. And um, if you want to call me, if you want to call me, I'm happy to help you with that. I did have my information up. I don't know how, and if, how we can get it out to folks. But... <clears throat> Uh, I'm happy to work with you if you call me and see what I can do to get you to the right person. There are clinics. Clinics here have case managers, too. I think your contact information might have been in your slide deck, which we sent out. So we can, we're going to resend those again okay. uh, when everyone has your contact okay. information. Thank you, Leslie. Sounds good. And then yeah. next question, why do medical providers make it so hard for schools to get medical orders uh, to assist um, kids with special needs and the additional release of information is hard to get from busy special, um, parents. Oh, I know. The release of information is really hard for schools. 
And it is that way because it's not as um, protected, if you will, when we fax to a school, it goes to the front office or not. You know, where is it going? Who's looking at it? And do you want everybody in the school knowing the business of that mom and that child? So uh, the release of information for schools is a, is a thing, and it is hard um, to get, so I agree. And why they make it so hard, you know, my first thought when I saw that was is time, <laughs> time management and the busyness of folks. Um, if the child has home nursing, there is already a plan of care that's put in place by that home nursing agency. I would hope that you'd be able to get that plan of care if they have home nursing. Um, but why it's so hard, it's a great question. Uh, I think time. I think that case managers, at least in our system, write a lot of the orders for the doctors to sign. And because we know what's going to generate phone calls and what's going to generate confusion. And I don't think sometimes that all the doctors know what to write it, what's a complete order for the school to work with. Thank you, Leslie. I wish I had and a how, better answer. And then how can we advocate or request that a case manager such as you come to our, uh, the school for IP meetings or to establish a school plan and support for children with medical complexity? Yeah. So um, it, every system is different. With Seattle Children, I'm an inpatient case manager, so I don't cross over to outpatient. It's, it's a separate design. Uh, TLC, it's a small core, it's only like 200 children out of thousands that have TLC, and those nurses would do it. There is clinic nurses, so depending on the clinic, um, some would have case managers, some won't. Uh, but the clinic, if they're within our clinic system, and I would guess that within the clinic system at Mary Bridge, I would hope that you'd be able to find a case manager that could participate in the IEP meetings. Let me know if that doesn't if that answer is not helpful. There is a question about your ability to share the trach safe emergency airway diagram with folks on the call. Yeah, I can. Uh, I have a sample. We have. In the huh? We have. We we have your stuff. So, just wondering if you, if it's okay with you that we share it too. Oh sure. Yeah, if you have a copy <laughs> of one, go for it. I have one, but I have to look around my email a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we can um, we can also attach that as a part of our follow up email to you all. Um, that was as far as questions that came in through Mentimeter. Uh, there was additional questions in the chat uh, for a, a child on uh, with a ventilator who needs RN support at school. Who's responsible for paying for the private duty nurse during school hours? I'm wondering if you have answers to that question. Yeah, so private duty nursing falls to the uh, school district to provide and fund. There's a reimbursement mechanism from the state that sort of their business, so I don't get into that part of it. But for like a trach and vent dependent child is one-to-one -one nursing, the school district is on the hook to provide that, that person. I talked to a, a Puyallup school district yesterday and gave them um, maybe some better suggestions of agencies that they could use to get that one-to-one -one nurse. The one they were using, I haven't heard of. I would wonder about their training. Um, yeah, they, but they are, they are on the hook to, to fund that, which sometimes they try to, it's just hard. It's expensive. It's not cheap. So, um, mm -hmm. but over time, they've gotten actually more accustomed to it. That's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, this is my own question, um, you know, with the acuity in our patient population in pediatrics and um, more kids are surviving, you know, childhood illnesses and potentially be, being more medically complex once they get are discharged from the hospital, what, um, what can we do now to create that infrastructure? Because I feel like, it, you know, the shortage now is going to be amplified years down the road with advances in technology and whatnot. So what can we do now to lobby or change laws or anything like that? Yeah, that's a great answer. A great question, sorry. Uh, and yeah, and when, I, when you were talking, I was think of we've gone from rescuing uh, having 23 weeks be the point that we resuscitate and now outside hospitals are resuscitating down to 22 weeks, 
which people have different feelings about and different opinions about. So we're, you know, potentially adding complex kids to that system at 22 weeks. You could certainly are at high risk for some some problem, right? Um, many problems. So yeah. So legislatively, I've been working with a group of folks in the community to try, because of the home nursing shortage, to get legislation this year to do what I call new models of care because there's not enough home nursing kids stuck in the hospital that uh, and there's not enough nursing to take them out and they can't keep growing here. Uh, we're trying to get legislation to get new models of care so that non-nurses can learn this. There's a way to do it. We already teach parents. They're non-nurses and they do a fine job. How can we move that on to others? Uh, we have to have new legislation for that. And uh, how can we get parents paid? Uh, because of the poverty, uh, the parents that provide this care are collectively in the United States giving up $1.76 billion in, in uh, revenue for themselves, personal income, because they have to stay home and care for these kids. And the financial losses are huge. So we're trying to get uh, parents paid, and that's legislation we're working on right now. Well, that would be really awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah. A question that came to me privately, do all medically complex children qualify for DDA services? I'm not sure what DDA stands for. And yeah. is this how they access possibilities in home nursing care? So I'll do the first part first. So uh, DDA has its own criteria. It doesn't, it's not based on money. It's based on diagnoses. And the diagnoses change from zero to four four to 10, 10 and over, 18 and over. So the criteria is all different. Um, I would say that mostly the zero to four are easier to qualify for DDA as compared to older. If you get on a DDA website, you can see they, they will break it down by age as what qualifies you for DDA services. And then what was the second part, Han? Is that how they access home nursing care? How they access those, home nursing care? Yeah, is through those services? Through DDA? Yes, that was the question that came in. So DDA itself doesn't uh, pay for nursing until you're 18 and over. So the MCOs, uh, Med Managed Medicaid, pays for nursing from 0 to 18, well, 0 to 17, and when you turn 18, then DDA pays for it. But really, it's the MCOs um, from 0 to 17. And they just have, everybody has different quali uh, different. Um, standards, but they're close. They're not terrible different. You have to present typically that the child needs four or more hours of continuous nursing care to qualify. That's a generalization. Um, but really, when you call up an MCO and say, I think this kid really needs home nursing because they need this and that and that and that, and this is the risk and this is what happens, pretty good listeners at the MCOs to, to develop home nursing, but it really falls with Medicaid until you're 18. Thank you for that, Leslie. I feel like so much of your job is interpreting and making sure that you're making sure people qualify in, <laughs> in so many ways <laughs> yeah. and that they get all that they need. Yeah, and people who say, no, we're not going to pay for that. I take that on as a challenge. 